you know, there's things we can preach, but there's other things we have to live it through. <laughs> so immortality has been preached through by the time of 2000s. My husband always said 1900s. They first started speaking in tongues, then 1913s. Baptisms was opened up like freely. Before the time there was people that did it, but it was generally accepted. And then the 40s came the healing revivals and we lived in a place where there were so many miracles and then the dead start being raised as the order of the day. And my husband started preaching immortality. That's the final mystery revealed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. And I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to wake up for the time we are in. And how is it going to happen this way? There's going to be a trumpet. The announcement is coming. What is it else than it's being preached? Then the dead will raise and then the living will be changed. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 4 because he says here, I do not want you ignorant of it. He says, we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Voila! He confirms 1 Corinthians 15. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God. The trumpet is going to be God himself, not the Son of Man. The Son of Man comes on the clouds of heaven and those that pierced him will see him. They will feel the brunt of it. That's Revelation 1, 8, 9. But here, this the God himself, he says, I'm giving you this by the word of God. This is what God revealed to Paul. I'm giving it to you. God himself is going to come down. He is the trump and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up, not rapture. Adam fell down. We will be caught up. We're not going to another place. We're going to another state of being. We're going to that perfection, the realm of perfection of light life where there is no death. <laughs> and we which are remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, to meet the Lord in the state. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh my word. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He brought life and immortality through the light of the gospel. You know, I always wondered about Paul. And I'm thinking, he, he was caught up into this place. He saw all these visions and yet he was bound with this time. Isn't it time just a frustration when you are... Before school, you just want to go to school. When you're there, it's not what you thought. Then you just want to go to high school. And when you get there, it's not what you thought. Then you just want to go to college. And when you get there, it's not what you thought. And then, then you want to marry. And when you get there, it's not what you thought. And then you want children. And when you get there, it's not what you thought. And then you're old. And you look back and say, oh, I wish I was young. Your whole life, you've wished it past. Now you want to go back. This is the frustration of time and existing. It's a chasing of the wind. But God says, if you want real bread, come to me. I'm going to feed you and you're going to be satisfied because so you will ever be with me. The final comfort is that, guys, we're going to be what God originally intended for us to be. And this poor, poor guy, he saw all this and... This is why he says in Philippians, he says, according to my earnest expectation, what is this earnest expectation? Until the redemption of the body. Now Paul says, I've got this earnest expectation, but I'm bound in time. And he says, and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness and always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be, by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. 
Yet what I shall choose, I would not. For I am a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is so much far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more abundant for you. And then he goes into um, Philippians 3 verse 10. In the message he says, My intention is, while I'm in this body, to know and understand this power that exerts from without His resurrection, that He exerts on believers because of the resurrection, that I will find this power even in my body. Nowhere clear can you get it when Paul goes in Philippians um, 3 verse 10. This is just before he departed and he knew he was departing and that he was never going to taste what the final generation in the Christ generation is going to taste. And I'm like, guys, it's time to wake up. But listen to Paul. He says, and this, so that I might know him experientially becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him, understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely and in the same way experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, and that I might share the fellowship of his suffering by this being continually conformed inwardly into his likeness, even into his death, dying as he did, so that I might attain to the resurrection that will raise me from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it. This goal of being Christ-like or have already been made perfect, but I actively press on so that I might take hold of that perfection for which Christ Jesus took hold of me and made me his own. And I want this even while I'm in my body. This is what Paul was carrying. And he's saying, I so much want this. David saw it and he says, God takes pleasure in the death of his saints. And John wrote, Blessed are those that die in Christ, for they rest from their labor and they work follow them. Jesus came and said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. All these things you can only find in Christ.